these computers. Y'all hear that announcement when it comes on like that? Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Wakes me up. <laughs> okay, we're recording the cloud. Hello, everyone. This is Dr. Roger Paul, and tonight we're going to continue our study of Paper 48, uh, The Mirage Life, and we're on page four hundred five hundred forty-eight 548 of the original book. Uh, or that's 48, 548 of the original book. Yep. Uh, paragraph seven. And or if you're looking up under the papers, it's it's paper 48, section four, paragraph 12. And that's where we left off last time is the one right above that. OK. Sweetie, if you want to hit just OK down there in that little blue box, just hit OK. There you go. It'll go away that way. <clears throat> OK, let's get started. Pam, you remember Roy, don't you, from the other house? Is Pam you know, it's yeah. been such a long time, I don't remember. No? Hey, Pam. Roy, do you remember me? Oh, uh, I can't say it. <laughs> <laughs> It's okay. Yeah, he came to the, <laughs> he came to this house a couple of times too. So. Yeah, I've been that. Yeah. yeah, yeah, at the new one. So that's when I was building the cat habitat. Habitat. Right. habitat. Yeah. Okay, y'all. Let's get started. Diane, would you take the first one, please, dear? Most of us have come up through lower stages of existence or through progressive levels of our orders. And it is refreshing and in a measure amusing to look back upon certain episodes of our early experience. There is a restfulness in the contemplation of that which is old to one's order and which lingers as a memory possession of the mind. The future signifies struggle and advancement. It bespeaks work, effort, and achievement. But the past savers of, these, of things already mastered and achieved Contemplation of the past permits of relaxation and such a carefree review as to provoke spirit mirth and a marantia state of mind verging on merriment. That's delightful. So when we look at our past, we can kind of look at ourselves and kind of laugh at ourselves, I guess. <laughs> right. and, you know, it's kind of funny. Me and Diane was talking about this the other day, how, you know, if you look back on your life, the older you get, it almost seems like your life is cut into sections. You know, you had your childhood and everything happened during your childhood. Then you had your young adult and teenage years and all the things that went on during that time, you know, dating and all that stuff. And then you go into your young adult year when you're trying to find your place in life, what you're going to do for a living, that sort of thing. And eventually you get to your retirement years. You know, and each one of these seems like a section of life. If you think back on it, it almost seems like a hazy dream, doesn't it? it does you know, any way you look at it. And it's kind of that way when you get to the mansion world. When you look back on, on your entire life, you had all those experiences, but they're as sharp as they were back then, right? And so they all seem kind of like a hazy dream. And they talk about in the book, uh, those who are not just or indwell, those who are, are become, get a spirit fragment, when they wake up, they have no memory of their past at all. So to them, it's like starting from scratch. So for those individuals, then the guardian angels has, have to rehearse their life. In other words, their entire life they had before the guardian angels replays it for them so that they can regain the memories that they didn't have when they wake, woke back up. Right. So we're kind of fortunate the fact that we we're going to be a gesture into out. So, cause we'll still have our memories, but even us, you know, as you get older, things just kind of fall off a little bit at a time. And you only remember the things when you get there that are spiritually spiritual. And the th point I need to make here is this. Every relationship you have with another human being is what? Spiritual. Spiritual. That's right. That's right. So all those things in your life 
that you remember when you get to the mansion world are your experience, spiritual experiences. And most all of them have to do with other human beings, right? Okay. Ask a question? Yeah. First sentence, even mortal humor we come from, no, you changed the screens, you son of a oh, gun. Oh, did I? <laughs> yeah. There we go. Watch we that, go. Roy, now. There we Most go. of us come up through uh, lower stages of existence or through progressive levels of our orders. And it is refreshing and in a measure amusing to look back upon certain episodes of our early existence. Are they saying that uh, this is a type of reincarnation, like from earthworm to snake to ant eater or whatever well uh, or uh, is i don't what, what's that sentence saying it's saying that you're going to have a rebirth on the first mansion world you'll go from a uh, a moth to a butterfly well not a moth but a, a worm to a butterfly right and your moranchi existence is the butterfly stage of existence right when you hit the spiritual world, you go up even higher. You could compare that to going from a butterfly to a. Uh, the only thing I can think of is what's these little things that you used to like to look at the, with the wings and flap around. And can't think of the name of them. Anyway, like angels on angels, not <laughs> angels. <laughs> but, um, so you're saying the evolution is. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. You're Fair. saying the. Uh, what the Indians suggest, uh, you evolve from an insect or an amoeba and on up, and they just re. Or are you using that as a metaphor? I'm type of... using that as a metaphor. We don't literally do that. We start out as humans, and because we start out as humans, we got our badge of courage to go on to become Marancha beings, right? Okay. And once you step into that Marancha existence, and fusion happens, then you live forever, right? Until no. then, you're just faith sons of God, okay, up to the time of fusion. And that includes on the mansion worlds. On the first few mansion worlds, for most people, they're still just faith sons and daughters of God because they're waiting to fuse to become what? Real sons of God. Make sense? Mm -hmm. Now, yes. Okay. So, you did very well today. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Let's talk about this paragraph just a little bit more before I just skip right over it like I did. All right. What they're talking about here is it's restful when we get to that next stage to look back on our memory. They call them memory possessions. Okay. So these are memories each and every one of us have individually. And the interesting thing is this, because we have friends and things like that, like we have in this group, we will have memory possessions that we own together. So groups of beings can get together and remember incidences that happens as a possession of one memory or a group memory. And then you can rebuild that memory totally from scratch from everybody's memory okay so it helps to have friends right and the other <clears> thing they talk about here is things that we've already mastered and achieved so this is where we come back to that earn space concept right as you go through the planets and you go up the scale you you earn that space and any space that you've earned you always have the right to sometime in the future return to Okay, so that's uh, that's very, very important. Okay, let me go back down here. Can I go forward or can I go back? No, I went forward. Okay, that's that's good. Uh, Jane, would you take the next one? Okay, if immortal humor becomes most hearty, when it depicts episodes affecting those just a little beneath one's present developmental state, or when it portrays one's supposed superior falling victim to the experiences which are commonly associated with supposed inferiors. You of Eurantia have allowed much that is at once vulgar and unkind to become confused with your humor 
but on the whole, you are to be congratulated on a comparatively keen sense of humor. Some of your races have a rich vein of it and are greatly helped in their earthly careers thereby. Apparently, you received much in the way of humor from your Adamic inheritance, much more than was secured of either music or art. So it's good to have humor, right? And if you're lucky, you can see the, the humor in all the things that you tried in life and failed, right? You go on, you learn from it, and hopefully you learn from it anyway. Trouble is with our planet, because we've got so much sin and rebellion still running rampant around here, most of our humor is vulgar and unkind, okay? And you can see that just turn on any channel on the TV, right? Most of the stuff we consider humorous is really cruel and indifferent to other people, which is not a good thing. But there is good humor out there if you just look for it, right? Oh, All right. Yeah. Roger. Yeah. Before Adam and Eve, uh, us mortals didn't respond to humor. No, we well, didn't find, find anything funny, right? I thought it was all, all serious. Yeah, yeah. Well, think about what everyone did back then. They spent all their time warring, trying to find food and sustenance and staying alive, right? Against the elements, against the animals, against other tribes. So there was not that much to be very humorous about, you know. If you were, I guess if you were humorous back then, you were considered an idiot, you know, somebody that was you know, a little... A little crazy, uh, you know, like I am now. So <laughs> just look at me. All right. Okay. It's funny. I had a discuss with somebody discussion last night uh, about this very subject, you know, that uh, uh, I spent 50 years of my life, you know, on this book. And uh, some people would say I was insane. Because of that, you know? <laughs> so it's all in your perspective, right? All right, Roy, you want to take the next one? Uh, sure. Okay. okay. Which one is it? I thought it was all satanic. Which one is it? When we are tempted. Okay. When we are tempted to magnify our self-importance, if we stop to contemplate the emphasis of the greatness and grandeur of our maker, our own self-glorification become sublimely ridiculous. <laughs> Even virgin on the humors, one of the function of humor is to help all of us make a take ourselves less seriously. Humor's, humor is the divine antidote for exaltation of ego. Boy, don't we need more of that. <laughs> we got a lot of that going on around the planet, don't we? I love this sublimely ridiculous <laughs> so, you know, it's kind of funny if you think about it, it'd be kind of like us looking back at the monkeys and trying to make sense out of what they're doing, you know? <laughs> and what they're doing is mocking us. That's right. <laughs> All right. Let's go on here. Uh, Rodney, I think you're up next. It's all right. The need for the re relaxation and diversion of humor is greatest in those orders of ascendant beings who are subjected to sustained stress <laughs> in their upward struggles. The two extremes of life have little need for humorous diversions. Primitive men have no capacity, therefore, and, a, and beings of paradise perfection have no need thereof. The host of Havana are naturally a joyous and exhilarating assemblage of supremely happy personalities. On paradise, the quality of worship obviates mm -hmm. the necessity for reversion activities. But among those who start their careers far below the goal of paradise perfection, there is a large place for the ministry of the reversion directors. 
Okay, so by the time you get to paradise, you don't need the humor anymore. It, it's been replaced by a joyous life and a perfect existence, right? You know, and it's hard for us to understand that because we have no planets that we've been to that's near light and life or even close that we could comprehend living in existence that is uh, totally joyous, spiritual, that sort of thing all the time. Okay, so it's hard for us to even relate to such a thing, really. All right. Gary, would you take the next one, please? The higher the mortal species, the greater the stress and the greater the capacity for humor as well as the necessity for it. Um, in the spirit world, the opposite is true. The higher you ascend, the less the need for diversions of, of reversion experience. But proceeding down the scale of spirit life from paradise to the seraphic hosts, there is an increasing need for the mission of mirth and uh, the ministry of merriment. Those beings who most need the refreshment of periodic reversion to the intellectual status of previous experiences are the higher types of human species the Marachans, Mar Mar uh, angels, and the material sons, together with all similar types of personality. So the lower you go, the uh, smarter son of a gun you should be. That's, well, you, you need reversion uh, because you get exhausted spiritually. And, you know, think about it this way. Even the angels appreciate our humor. OK, and that why is that? That's because they're on the lower end of the scale, too. They start out on the lower end of the scale. So they uh, enjoy reversion just like we do, which makes perfect sense, because if they accompany accompany us on everything we do as Moranchian beings, uh, they'd be bored to death if, if they did. not Right. So uh, so it's it's nice to know that, you know, this is the case all the way down the scale. It's not just us. All right. Let's see here. Pam, I think you're up. Okay. Humor should function as an automatic safety valve to prevent the building up of excessive pressure due to the monotony of sustained and serious self-contemplation in association with the intense struggle for developmental progress and noble achievement. Humor also functions to lessen the shock of the unexpected impact of fact or of truth, rigid, unyielding fact, and flexible, ever-living truth. The more personality, never sure as to which, oh, the mortal personality, never sure as to which will next be encountered through humor, swiftly grasps, sees the point, and achieves insight. The unexpected nature of the situation uh, of the situation be in fact or be it fact or be it truth. Okay, because when we as human beings uh, or mirage beings even uh, come in contact with fact and truth, sometimes it's <laughs> shocking to us. Think of it this way. When, what was your reaction the first time you read in the Urantia book that Christ didn't die for your sins? But that was shock, was it not? I mean, kind of a for me, it wasn't. Well, I was relieved. Yeah. No, for me. Yeah. yeah, it was for me. I thought, you know, I've been taught my whole life, I've been out preaching that, that Christ died for our sins, you know? And when I read this in this book, that he didn't die for our sins. <laughs> It was a big, big, fat, big, big shock to me because I had never been taught that no sacrifice was needed for sin and that God the Father forgave us of our sins. So that's a, just a uh, what you would consider a rigid, unyielding fact. There's no grounds to go either way with it. Okay. 
And when you run into something like that or uh, unyielding tr of truth or unflexible truth, when you find these truths, sometimes it's shocking to you. And one thing's for sure, if you read this book, you're going to find some shocking truths all the way through it. Are you not? Sure. So, that mm -hmm. makes a big difference. So if you understand that, it kind of prepares you a little bit for it. And part of the humor they're talking about here is kind of a pressure valve for discovering these things and being to live with it and incorporate it into your life. Okay. Now my wonderful wife's going to read next. Well, the humor of Urantia is exceedingly crude and most inartistic. It does serve a valuable purpose, both as a health insurance and as a liberator of emotional pressure, thus preventing injurious nervous tension and over-serious self-contemplation. Humor and play relaxation are never reactions of progressive exertion. Always are they the echoes of a backward glance, a reminiscent of the past. Even on your rancha, and as you now are, you always find it rejuvenating when for a short time you can suspend the exertions of the newer and higher intellectual efforts and revert to the more simple engagements of your ancestors. Hmm. <laughs> So it's okay if you watch cartoons then, huh? <laughs> you revert back to childhood. Right? We don't do that, by the way. We don't do that. <laughs> by the way, it just came out of my mouth, <laughs> you know. But to clear personally, <laughs> I prefer you, uh, you, uh, somebody, Sam. Yeah. <laughs> the point is, we can look back on, at our past, backward at our past, and we can kind of laugh at ourselves and not take ourselves so seriously. Because if you let yourself, you can get into this rut of working and taking care of kids and all these other things and not realizing that life is a, a, a many different, different faceted thing. You know, you got to everything in moderation, as they say, right? If you get too serious, you're getting too serious. Well, a lot has to do with how you're, what, how you were raised to, you know. Yeah. I mean, it's hard to get over some things. Yeah. Very hard. Very hard. Yeah. Some things. Yeah. Okay. You know, we were saying that, you know, I went through that process. I've worked all my life, and all of a sudden, I reached this period in life where I had to retire. Mm-hmm. So I went from doing sixty-five miles now to zero. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> It's a good example, really. And, and so, are you sure a, you didn't hit seventy every now and then? No, I haven't hit seventy yet. I'm still, I'm six or seven. But uh, I was talking about the speed. Oh, oh, yeah, but no, I, I went over that. Yeah. Okay. But my point is that, just like you say, the changes in the different phases of life. Mm -hmm. I, I remember not taking the time to slow down, to enjoy life, just working to benefit others and myself. But then you get this, I reached this point in my life where I, I had some quiet. Mm -hmm. and I, Contemplation and just, time, right? Contemplation yes. time. And yeah. so I went through that process. And, you know, people ask me now, oh, Roy, you know, you had your own business, for, uh, blah, blah, blah. You don't miss? No. Yeah. No. No, I don't miss that that uh mm -hmm. and I'm happy to be here. This is another phase of my life. Yeah. And uh I'm enjoying it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's interesting cuz the the when I was working full time it was the people I miss when I stopped. It wasn't the job. I, I it took me a long time to realize <laughs> that I thought it was the job, but it was really just the people because you see certain people come in on a regular basis and you get to know them and everything and you become parts of their life you know and then when they're suddenly gone it's it's a shock it's readjusting you know so jane would you take the next one sweet please please okay the principles of urantia play life are philosophically sound and continue to apply on up through your ascending life, <clears throat> through the circuits of Havona to the eternal shores of paradise. 
As ascendant beings, you are in possession of personal memories of all former and lower existences. And without such identity, memories of the past, there would be no basis for the humor of the present, either mortal laughter or morontia mirth. It is this recalling of past experiences that provides the basis for present diversion and amusement. And so you will enjoy the celestial equivalent of your earthly humor all the way up through your long morontia and then increasingly spiritual careers. And that part of God, the adjuster, which becomes an eternal part of the personality of an ascendant mortal, contributes the overtones of divinity to the joyous expressions and even spiritual laughter of the ascending creatures of time and space. Sounds wonderful, doesn't it? It does sound wonderful. Mm -hmm. it's, you know, yeah. not much I just thought of something. Yeah. We're evolving to a humorless environment. How do you figure that? Well, eventually in paradise, yeah, I guess. But <laughs> so really, I mean, you know, am I not right? I mean, because we once we evolve higher, the yeah. need for humor is not as needed. essential. That's right. Yeah, because you go up on the spiritual ladder, right? In this world, though, we need as much humor as we can get, <laughs> right? <laughs> All the time. <laughs> So, you think Biden will take uh, credit for uh, that or not? Mm. <laughs> I doubt it. <laughs> no politics. <laughs> no politics. That's right. All right. Man, five, the Mansion World Teachers. Let's see who's up. Uh, Roy, I believe you're up again. All right. Number five, the Mansion World Teachers. The Mansion World Teachers are a corp of deserted but glorified sheriffs and sail fins. When a pilgrim of time advanced from a trial world of space to the mansion and associate worlds of Morancha training, he is accompanied by his personal or group seraphim, the guardians of destiny. In the world of mortal existence, the seraphims are amply assisted by sheriffs and sail fins. But when her mortal ward is delivered from the bonds of the flesh and start out on the Senate career when the post material of Marantia life begin, the attending seraphim has no further need of the administration of her former lieutenant. The seraphim and Sel the cherubim and Sanobam. Seven, these yeah. these are the two little angels, right? When you get assigned your guardian of destiny or your angels, two angels, two seraphim, you're also assigned one cherubim and one sanobim. Now, when you pass and you go on to the mansion worlds, the services of the cherubim and sanobim are no longer required by the seraphim. OK, so they're relieved from duty and many time they go on to become mansion world teachers. OK, because they've got experience with a human being. OK, but unlike the seraphim, which are assigned to you and will stay with you all the way through the process, the cherubim and the sanobim will be released to do other functions and become teachers and that sort of thing. OK, so that's what they're talking about here. Okay, but uh, it says that uh, the corpse of deserted but glorified. So these are fallen serpents. No, these are these are the cherubim and the sanobam are not the same class as the seraphim. Okay, but I'm saying the, so yeah, the seraphim are guardian seraphim. That's what they call them, guardian angels, right? And on the, when you reach the third circle, you're assigned two of those. And you're also assigned a cherubim and a sanabim, which are the lesser angels. But when you graduate and go on to the mansion worlds, the seraphim no longer needs them to help with you. So they're released from service, from your service as a mortal. And then they many times go on to become mansion world teachers. Now, that's not always the case. Sometimes they're reassigned to another human being on the planet. 
So that's it differs for different people. Yeah, Pam. Um, so you see on the second line there, deserted. I, I didn't yeah, really kind of understand. Yeah, because when you go on, they don't follow you. That's why they call them deserted. Hmm. In other words, when you leave the planet, the seraphim yeah. goes with you. They stay here and they have to be reassigned either to another mortal or yeah. to uh, another job on the mansion worlds. Okay. Okay. That's why they're called deserted. Yeah, Gary. What is the function on this world of the Seraphim and Sanovan? They make life difficult for you. <laughs> That's the easiest they way. Cards. They put That's not right. I've got a wife for that. <laughs> Ooh. I'm I'm joking about that, but really in reality, that's what they do. They put things in your pathway, in your experience, so that you can make spiritual decisions. Okay, so their job is to put things in front of you or put th put you in situations so that you can learn from these situations and make more and more and more decisions because their job is to ha make you grow in this lifetime when the, when you get to the next lifetime when you get to the marancha lifetime it's the same thing they're there to help you push you along help you grow answer questions for you do everything possible to make sure you spiritually go from one section one thing to another okay so that's really their job now, the cherubim and sanobim are usually used for recording, okay? Everything in your life. Now, the seraphim do this same job, but the seraphim, if both the seraphim are busy doing something, they just give this responsibility to the cherubim or the sanobim so that every single thing that happens in your life is recorded so that you can take that with you to the mansion worlds. So nothing is lost. Okay. And people say, boy, if they're recording everything I do, boy, I better watch what I do, right? <laughs> <laughs> they take into account that you're human beings. So don't worry. All right. All right. Roy, did you have a question or was that? <clears throat> Excuse me. No, that was did it. You... I just wanted to understand oh, the okay. deserted part of that. Okay. Rodney? You said uh, that they're either uh, the they either minister to another mortal or yeah yeah they're released to go to the mansion world to become right. a mansion world teacher right mansion world teacher okay now they're the perfect beings to teach all these people that refuse to read the Urantia book why <laughs> damn. <laughs> Because they have experienced everything in a human life at least once, maybe many times. Mm -hmm. And they have personal experience being an angel for another, all types of mortal beings. So they can relate to you on a level just as if they had been there themselves because they had been there themselves. Make sense? Yep. Okay. And it doesn't matter if it's a cherubim or cenobim, their function is pretty much the same, right? Pretty close. All right. Okay. So now y'all are all experts on cherubim and cenobim, right? Nope. <laughs> okay. Your your seraphim and your cherubim and cenobim is going to be disappointed in you. Okay. Let's go on. Okay, let's see who read uh, Rodney. Who who just read Roy? Roy just read. Roy did, yeah. Rodney, would you take the next? Okay. Uh, these deserted assistants of the ministering seraphim are often summoned to universe headquarters, where they pass into the intimate embrace of the universe mother spirit, and then go forth to the system training spheres as mansion world teachers. These teachers often visit the material worlds and function from the lowest mansion worlds on up to the highest of the educational spheres connected with the universe headquarters. 
upon their own motion, they may return to their former associative work with a ministering seraphim. So notice here, if they if they go on to become teachers, they go to the local universe mother spirit for the embrace of the mother spirit. You see that? Mm -hmm. But if they return to their previous work, the associative work, uh, uh, they go back with a ministering, ministering seraphim back to the planet and get assigned to another person. Okay. Yeah. You see that? All right. That's what we were just talking about just a second ago. Now, you think there's just one or two of these in the universe? No. No. Gary, would you take the next one? There are billions upon billions of these teachers in the Santania, and their numbers constantly increase because in the majority of instances, when a seraphim proceeds inward with an adjuster-fused mortal, both the seraphim, seraphim and a Sanapin are left behind. See how smart Gary is. I ask him how many you think these are, and he just comes up. There's billions and billions of them. Did you catch that? Yes. It's, <laughs> it's, that's a, just uh, thing. it's a tech uh, technique I mastered in math class. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Let's keep going. Uh, Pam, I believe you're up next. Yeah. Mansion World teachers, like most of uh, the other instructors, are commissioned by the Melchizedeks. They are generally supervised by the Marancha Companions. But as individuals and as teachers, they are supervised by the acting heads of the schools or spheres wherein they may be functioning as instructors. Now, why would they be generally supervised by the Mansion World, um, by the uh, Marancha Companions, I mean? Y'all remember the thing about the Marancha Companions? They help with everything in our existence after we pass on through this life, right? So the Marancha Companions can help relate to these teachers what's going on with each individual person as they're going through their training and that sort of thing. So that's why they're generally supervised by these companions, but they're trained by the heads of the, the schools and the Melchizedek and that sort of thing. Yeah, Gary? We could, could uh, look at these Marantia companions more like as a function of a school counselor. Yes. Yeah, but they're much more than that. They're interpreters and, you know, set up trips and all sorts of things. So, but that's a good example, though, Gary. It would be a perfect example of how they would relate to the uh, the teachers, right? Okay. A lot. They think of everything. There's nothing left out. All right. Diane, you're up back here. The advanced cherubim usually work in pairs as they did when attached to the seraphim. They are by nature very near the Marancha type of existence, and they are inherently sympathetic teachers of the ascending mortals and most efficient, efficiently conduct the program of the mansion world and Marancha educational system. Now, why would be, they be inherently sympathetic? Because they've been through a life with the human being, so they know exactly where we're coming from, right? It's very so, comforting. Yeah, so it makes them perfect uh, yeah. teachers. Roger? Yeah. Hi. Uh, it, it says these cherubim. Um, yeah, they, they the mean cherubim too when they cherubim. say. Yeah. It just depends on if it's resting yeah. or not. Right, yeah. Really, if you think about it, when you see cherubim, you're talking about cherubim at the same time mm -hmm. because they work in pairs. They work off of each other. OK, so when you say cherubim, you can automatically think Sanabim at the same time. Right. Yeah. You, you yeah. normally won't find one without the other. Right. Because when they're in the resting mode, they're Sanabim. That's right. Well, when one of them's resting, the other takes over. Yeah. Right. Just like I don't know if you all remember when we studied uh, the Seraphim that the seraphim, one seraphim's always on duty. 
when one is resting or recharging, the other one's on duty and they record everything. At the same time, it works the same way with the cherubim. So the cherubim record everything. When they go into rest, the cherubim takes over recording everything. Now, why do you think this is so important? That's like a duplicate recording all the time, right? On two different levels. Why do you think this is so important? Which so part? The, the recording oh. of your life. <laughs> this, this way, a copy of this goes on to the archangel, right, of a record in Nebadon. And if any part is missing, it can be filled in by the opposite part. If the seraphim part is missing, the cherubim part can be fill it, fill it in. You see that? Why is this important? This, this is really an important point. Because they're because, not perfect. Because they're not perfect and a certain amount of them did what? Rebel. Rebel before. When they rebelled, then the archangel had to take it from them all their soul trust, all their records, all their everything having to do with recording people's lives. All this stuff had to go to the archangel of record because the seraphim defaulted. And there's there's no possible way your life can be lost. Any part of your life can be lost because of this duplication of services. So let me give you an example of that. If let's say that your particular seraphim and your particular sanobim defaulted and went into rebellion. You still with me? Yes. If that was the case, the, the, uh, the records they hold would immediately default to the archangel, to the archangel circuit. And that's the reason that the archangel of circuit, of our circuit is present when they revive you because <laughs> they have to verify that the person they put in this new body is you, your personality. Mm. Sounds okay. like uh, data. Ooh. Yeah, it's like data. It is they like probably data. didn't use that word because 100 years ago they didn't have the data they didn't have that term right you know but wouldn't you have thought the uh rebelling uh angels would want to keep these records <laughs> didn't matter if they did or not archangels more powerful than a regular seraphim the archangel yeah. the, the archangels have dominion over all the angels well, they're called they're archangels. Paradise they're, angels. Right? They're paradise angels. That's right. They're actually, they become local universe angels, but they start out as paradise angels. But many of them are local universe angels. These are archangels that are created by the creative mother spirit and the low and oh, really. Yeah. Uh, created by the local the local creator son and the creative mother spirit. But no universe can be functioning without a full core. I think it's like a thousand archangels all the time. So these archangels of the super universe are loaned to the local universe until the creator son and the creative mother spirit creates their own. Okay. I wasn't aware of that. Yeah. It's very complicated it's the way complicated. all this Huh? It is complicated. Yeah, all the all the stuff is worked out. But the whole point is this: the archangel has dominion over the seraphim, so they can literally take those soul. In other words, there's no possible way, even if your seraphim rebels, that any part of you has ever been lost. Does that make sense? The checks and balances. So when you meet your archangel, when you wake up, you should thank him for making sure you are you. Yeah. You're, not, you're not somebody else. Your memories or are yours. if you want to be a Rockefeller. <laughs> of course, being Rockefeller wouldn't matter in the mansion worlds, would it? No. no. <laughs> right? 
you know, it's kind of funny, y'all. The older you get, the less they, le less you're attached to things, you know. And when you're sitting at that time of death and you realize that all these things you've worried about your whole life mean nothing, you know, they really don't. The house, the cars, the whatever. They really don't mean, the only thing that mean means anything at all is relationships and love. When uh, Johnny Cash was done, <laughs> he wrote a song. He said, you can take my pile of dirt. Yes. <laughs> That's what it is. It's a pile of dirt, right? <laughs> it makes me funny when I think about all these guys that's got these fancy cars they've built in their garage. I built one when I was younger, you know, I got all these fancy cars built in their garage, you know, they take out on the weekends and ride around looking cool, you know, and they don't mean anything. <laughs> yeah. When well, they you die. Know, I don't, you know, I kind of understand what you're saying, but. Isn't that a form of recreation? Like I, uh, I uh, fish. It is. It and is. I don't it's have anything yeah. fancy or anything like that now. You know. Yeah, but Gary, uh, it becomes a problem when it becomes a problem in your life. In other words, when you put those things above other things that are more important. And what's more important? Any relationship you have, right? So yeah. if you if you come out and your wife says, "Won't you get out of this garage?" What do you need to do? Get out of the garage. Go have a drink with your wife. <laughs> <out> garage, <laughs> you know? All right. <laughs> with me, it's my old shed now. It's a tool shed that never gets used. Yeah, lots of tools. <laughs> lots of tools. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's move on. Who's next? I think Jane was up next. Did you just redo? Um, I, I think it's like huh? Diane really is. Wasn't it, Diane? Yeah, uh, I think it was. Jane, take this next one. Okay, okay. In the schools of the Morancia life, these teachers engage an individual, group, class, and mass teaching. On the mentioned word, such schools are organized in three general groups of 100 divisions each. The schools of thinking, the schools of feeling, and the schools of doing. When you reach the constellation, there are added the schools of ethics, the schools of administration, and the schools of social adjustment. On the universe headquarters worlds, you will enter the schools of philosophy, divinity, and pure spirituality. Notice as you go higher, the, the subjects become a little more important, right? I mean, any, any way you look at it, you know, because we got a pretty good school of feeling on this planet, don't we? Everything is touchy feely, right? So you could say we get our feel of the touch of feel, the school of feeling. Now, some of us get a little bit of the school of thinking, but not all of us, right? Mm. <laughs> all right. The schools of doing, I put Ooh. my time in on that one. <laughs> you know, so sometimes we get the opportunity to do that, and sometimes we don't. All well, right. I've got it made with a school of thinking because I think of doing all the time. <laughs> good one, Gary. Yeah. That's very Thank good. you. <laughs> uh, okay, Roy, you take the next one, please. All righty. Those things which you might have learned on earth, but which you failed to learn, must be acquired under the tutelage of these faithful and patient teachers. There are no royal roads, shortcuts, or easy path to paradise. Irrespective of the individual variations of the route, you master the lessons of one spirit before you proceed to another. At least this is true after you once leave the world or your nativity. So all those things that you think you're going to get out of learning, you don't, you know. So if you don't learn it in this life, you're going to have to learn it in the next. That's what I harp on all the time. If you don't learn this book on this life, you're going to get to learn it on the next one, right? Because these are basic concepts of what? Yeah. Our local universe. Okay? Uh, but you know, this is something, even in the first paragraph, it said the future signifies struggle and advancement. It be seeks work, effort, 
and achievement. So, you know, we never stop. Always, we, we always going to have responsibility. Mm -hmm. and yeah. so strive, as, strive, as, strive, right? Yeah, we're always striving. So there's no point in this evolution or this progression where we say, I don't have any responsibility. And I say that because, you know, people, a lot of people talk about going to heaven mm -hmm. and running out of things to do. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> You know, it always brings me back to the same thing. And I probably mentioned this years and years and years ago. It always reminds me of this movie called Zardoz. And you we've remember? seen it so many times. Yeah, it, it's got the guy that played, uh, oh, who was the secret agent? Oh, Maxwell Smart? No. Uh, the, Jew, the Jewish guy, uh, uh, he played... Um, Oh my goodness! I can't think. Um, Jewish guy. They make they've made all kinds of secret agent movies. He started out making five or six, and then some other guy took it over. And you know, anyway, it was a series. But he played in this movie called Zardoz, and Zardoz was a barbarian, rode a horse, ran around, killed people, and that sort of thing on this planet. And on this planet, it was close to like a kind of a city complex and stuff. But on this planet, you go to a certain spot and there's this clear wall surrounding this area and you can't penetrate this wall. So all the barbarians were stuck on the outside of the wall and all the eternal people were on the inside of the wall. Okay. So what happens is one of the guys gets tired of living in this. This is my point. One of the guys that was on the inside of the wall got bored, okay, because he ran out of things to do. Ooh. And so what he did is he let, and nobody killed each other in this perfect place inside this wall. Everything was hunky-dory, but their lives went on and on and on. Nobody got older. If they did something wrong, they would add 10 years to their life, that sort of thing, you know. So that's the only way anybody got older, but nobody ever died. So one of the guys got the idea that if he got one of these barbarians inside the wall, then that he could kill off all the Eternals. <laughs> okay. And it's interesting because he sneaks this guy in and he starts killing people like crazy. And it's kind of funny because he takes him to this library at one point and shows him this book. And guess what the book was? The Wizard of Oz. <laughs> and that's where Zardoz came from, the Wizard of Oz. So the whole point was that all this thing that they thought of life was all a scam, it was not true. Okay. But it's interesting, they say here, uh, it was talking about how you can't avoid problems, procrastination and stuff, even through eternity, because why? Sooner or later, you have to deal with it, right? That's the way it is. That's why it reminds me of this every time I read this, you know, this, this movie Zardoz. You know, and the movie wasn't that great, but it was no. just, yeah, yeah. But it was just an example of yeah. the way human beings think of things, you know, what's reality and what's not. And just the fact in this movie, there was an imperfect side and a perfect side. And you'd think the imperfect side would want to be inside the perfect side, but it was the opposite way. The imperfect, the perfect side was jealous of the imperfect side. Now, what does that sound like to y'all? Yeah. Kind of sounds like our life, right? And how the Caligaster 100 became jealous of the humans because they had all this opportunity, right? It's all in how you look at things. All right. Uh, who we have next? You just read, Roy? You just read. I think I just read. Okay, Rodney, would you take the next one? Yeah, sure. Um, one of the purposes of the Maharaja career is to effect the permanent eradication 
from the mortal survivors of such animal vestigial traits as procrastination, equivocation, well, uh, qualification, yeah. insincerity, problem avoidance, unfairness, and ease seeking. Have you worked the, with people like that before? <laughs> yeah. The Maracha life early teaches the young Maracha pupils that postponement is in no way sense avoidance. After the life in the flesh, time is no longer available as a technique of dodging situations or of circumventing disagreeable obligations. So you won't have time to fall back on to not do what you're supposed to do, right? That's just all there is to it. You got two more slides. Let's get through these two slides for you. Quick. No, and Roger, also, yeah. you know, the more, the faster you realize that you you gain in tackling the the the, the issues or problems, the faster you progress. That's right. That's right. It is. You know. You get in there and throw yourself in, you're going to find it real quick, right? Gary, would you take the next one? Beginning service on the lowest of the tearing spheres, the Mantra World teachers advance with experience through the educational spheres of the system and the constellation uh, of to the training worlds of sal solving them. They are subject to no special discipline either before or after they're embraced by the universe mother spirit. They have already been trained for their work while serving at, as seraphic associates on the world native to their pupils of mansion world soldiering. They have had actual experience with these advancing mortals on the inhabited worlds. They are pr practically and sympathetic teachers. They're practical and sy sympathetic teachers, wise and understanding instructors, able and efficient guides. They are entirely familiar with the ascendant plans and thoroughly experienced in the initial phases of the progressive career. And this is a uh, seraph or a sanabim or a, a, not a, yeah, a sanabim or a cherubim that's been embraced by the mother spirit and becomes a full-fledged seraphim. So they can go back and, and become a guardian angel just like they had experienced before. Oh. Okay, so it's kind of like their graduation into the seraphic order. Okay. All right, Pam, would you take the last one, please? Many of the older of these teachers, those who have long served on the worlds of Salvington, the Salvington circuit, are re-embraced by the universe, Mother Spirit. And from this second embrace, these cherubim and senabim emerge with the status of seraphim. Okay, so that's how they become, they go old, up in order as as seraphim at that point but you know it's kind of funny if you think about it y'all if they become seraphim what's the first first thing they're going to have to do they're going to have to go back and go through another human life with another person to be a guardian seraphim right and all the cherubim and sanabim have an, a, a desire to become seraphim you know it's just like we desire to become marancha beings and then spirit beings okay that explains why the uh, seraphim can delegate or supervise the uh, mm -hmm. sort, uh, sort. I can't. There's other two. Cherubim and okay. Yeah, because they've experienced it. They've done it, so they can yeah. supervise. That's right. That's exactly mm -hmm. right. Makes sense. So many of them do come from that this background. Okay, and then we're going to quit there for tonight. Let's have a prayer before we stop and stop the share. All right. And let's ha oh, have a little prayer and we'll quit for tonight. Roy, would you like to close us in prayer tonight? I can do that. Okay. 
Heavenly Father, thank you once again for allowing us to delve into your word and get a better understanding of our life and a feeling of which direction we're going in. We're grateful to have the spark of life of the thought of gesture that dwells in us. We're grateful for the peace of mind that we know that our direction, as long as we keep our eyes on you, is clear. We pray for our world and all the people in it, those that are hungry tonight, those that are in war, those that just died, Father. We just ask that you would touch our political leaders and let them know that you, your design for our life is one for us all. Thank you for these wonderful friends that we share the word with. And we ask that you open the eyes and hearts of all our brothers and sisters so better understand where they are and where they are going. In the heavenly Father's name, I pray. Amen. 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 Okay. Amen. We got Rick's, Rick's ex there, I think. Hey, Rick. Hello. Yeah. Um, yeah, I knew, I knew it started at, um, 6 p.m. my time eastern i'm in i'm in delaware but um i missed it but um hopefully i can come back you know for the beginning we w oh. we want you to come back and see us again let, let me stop the record on facebook here and, and the other recordings and we'll talk for a second hang on stop. Stop. it's a beautiful prayer it was Just oh, appreciate really? that roy huh so, Rick, tell us a little bit about yourself, man. 